Hi, everybody. I'm Ed Baker, and I'm proud to be your host producer on the Addiction Recovery Channel, otherwise known as ARC. For those of you just uh, tuning in for the first time, ARC is a show that's been designed and is uh, devoted, actually, to raising public consciousness regarding substance use disorder and this brain disease that we call, call addiction. Um, the purpose of the show really is to create compassion, to create empathy, so that this particular population can get the kinds of medical, psychotherapeutic, and support services that they need in order to live healthy and productive lives. It's my great uh, pleasure and honor today to host uh, my guest, Thomas J. Donovan, otherwise known as TJ, our state's uh, current uh, attorney general. Welcome to the show, TJ. Thanks for having me, Ed. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'd like to start with a couple of facts. Uh, one fact being that uh, TJ is the 26th uh, attorney general here in Vermont. He was elected almost exactly one year ago in November of uh, 2016. He's well into his first year of a two-year term. He's one of four Democratic attorneys general in the history of Vermont, mm. and he comes to the position following a 10-year um, history as state's attorney for Chittenden County, during which he had a, a distinguished uh, career. One of his most outstanding accomplishments was the development of the Rapid Intervention Community Court, which is a special project, a very progressive project, to deal with people who have committed nonviolent crimes that were, in fact, driven either by mental health or substance use disorders. This is a very progressive program. And I guess that's really what drives my first question, TJ. What, what do you think it is about your progressive philosophy, your worldview, when it comes to these particular populations that resonates so deeply and so widely with the population here in Vermont. Mm. If I'm not mistaken, you you received 66 percent of the vote in your election, so it was a, a landslide. <clears throat> well, thanks for reminding me of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. you, you know, and I think f for me, um, and I say this often, um, I grew up in this community. Um, I grew up in Burlington. Uh, I went to um, public schools, graduate from public schools. Um, and that was a great benefit to me because it exposed me uh, to a lot of different folks. Um, and when you, and to be perfectly blunt about it, um, I was pretty much a normal kid who uh, uh, made my share of mistakes. Uh, got into probably more uh, of my share of trouble. Um, but I knew that um, I knew that I belonged. I knew I, I knew that I was part of a community. I knew that I was part of a, um, uh, a, a big family. Uh, I, I had a sense of belonging, which is really important. You know, you talk about compassion and empathy and having that sense of belonging uh, to something bigger than yourself is, I don't think people realize how, mm -hmm. how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. And I, I had it. And so when I became st state's attorney, and frankly when I was a, a, you know, a deputy prosecutor, um, I dealt with a lot of folks who were involved in the criminal justice system that I knew. Mm -hmm. okay. I grew up here, um, uh, knew them. Uh, if I didn't know them, I certainly knew somebody who knew them. Or, or I, knew, I knew where they were from. And my experience of having grown up and you know, engaged in um, those so, those same formative experiences that they did, and at some point in time, our, our paths di diverted. Uh, they didn't divert because I was better. Um, they didn't divert because I was special. They probably diverted for a whole set of complex reasons, one being opportunity, uh, two, resources, uh, three role models, if you will, all that 
frankly, I, I had. And sure. looking back, I, I know others didn't. Sure. And so when you see folks in the criminal justice system that you grew up with, uh, that you knew, you know they're not bad people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on top of that, uh, to have insight um, 20 years after the fact, 10 years after the fact, of uh, that a lot of these folks didn't have the resources, uh, came out of some pretty tough backgrounds, uh, didn't have the opportunities I had. I just didn't think they should have been punished uh, as severely or as, har- as harshly as many of them were. Yeah. Uh, and in my opinion, we've marginalized a whole subset of our population in the name of public safety, uh, mostly the poor, and it hasn't worked. And then you add on these issues of addiction, mm-hmm. you add on these issues of mental health, uh, and you got you got a perfect storm. And so for me, um, I just felt strongly about believing in, in people who I grew up in, grew up with, uh, who I went to school with, who I played basketball with, uh, that they deserved a fair shot. Exactly. Um, and they deserved an opportunity, the same opportunity that, that I received. And really a belief that I was no better and no different. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just happened to be a matter of circumstance. Um, f- to be perfectly blunt about it. Yeah, and that's 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 really clear, and that would be the perfect reason why people would resonate with you so deeply, because it's so clear that you're you're one of us. Yeah, you're one of them. <clears throat> and your piece about people not being bad. You know, a lot of times people are seen as being bad or criminal when their behavior really is a symptom yeah. of something that runs yeah. a little bit deeper. <clears throat> so I can I can feel your your connection to all Vermonters. It's it's palpable. Having said that, then, um, you know, I'd like to I'd like to know what your feelings are about this present uh, fentanyl crisis here in Vermont. We're yeah. seeing it in every county, on yep. every street corner, uh, every day. What do you What are your feelings about that? I know that you were instrumental in crafting legislation, the Good Samaritan yep. Law, to make naloxone. Yep common in Vermont? What, what are your feelings about what's happening today? Well, again, you know, this comes down to saving people's lives. Um, and I, I think, again, understanding and, and reinforcing that, you know, people who are addicted to, uh, to, to heroin, to, to opiates, and uh, now using fentanyl, extremely dangerous, mm-hmm. uh, incredibly toxic and deadly, as we know, their lives have value. And for those of us that are in public safety, um, I, it's very simple for me. Our job is to do everything we can to save people's lives. Mm-hmm. So I, I do believe all first responders, um, including all police, uh, should carry naloxone. Um, e- hundreds, if not thousands of Vermonters, uh, lives have been saved as a, result, uh, as a result of naloxone. I do believe that. Um, and it, it, look, you know, getting sober is hard. Um, and I know it's frustrating. I, I talk to folks, um, people who are on the front lines who get frustrated because they say, hey, I was there last week and I administered naloxone and this person's life was saved and now I'm coming back a second time and now I'm coming back a third time. Yeah. And there's a degree of frustration and I, and I recognize and I acknowledge that frustration from people on the front line, particularly those first responders. Um, it, but in spite of that fr- frustration, um, we have to understand that number one, we respect the work and we have to value the work our first responders do. Mm-hmm. Um, they should be adequate, uh, adequately compensated. They should be protected. Mm-hmm. Their families should be taken care of uh, because they put themselves in harm's way. But we can't lose sight uh, of the fact that the job is to save people's lives. And I do think when we're talking about an overdose, um, it shouldn't be, you know, you talk about the Good Samaritan. For me, it's not about, and this was really kind of the basis of that law, that if we focus, if we shift the focus, and I think this is uh, symbolic of what's going on uh, in the criminal justice system at a systems level, if we shift the focus from from getting people in trouble Mm -hmm. to saving people's lives, Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna have a more effective system because in the past, really, again, the basis of that Good Samaritan law was when there's an overdose, what do people do? They get scared that they're gonna get in trouble, sure. that they perhaps gave their friend some drugs mm-hmm. that they're now ODing on, and they don't call 911. Mm-hmm. They flee, they run, they're scared, they don't wanna get in trouble. 
And the message that we wanted to send was, we're not condoning drug use or dispensing drugs. That's not what we're condoning. But what we're saying, what the message was, this is about saving lives. Yeah. We can figure out kind of the responsibility afterwards, but job number one is to save people's lives. Every life has potential. Uh, that's what we should be focused on. Uh, and I think if, if we remember that, that should guide us in, in sound public policy to continue to reform our criminal justice system. Uh, I think we, we've done a lot of good work in Vermont. Uh, we got more work to do. Um, you know, we look at this issue of addiction and, and we get angry with people. And I know it's frustrating. Uh, I know that. Um, but that's not a reason to incarcerate and to punish. Mm -hmm. uh, we're angry and upset with them. They're not, they're not necessarily a threat to us. Um, and so, th as you know, this is complicated because you talk to somebody whose house is robbed or burglarized or his car, mm -hmm. it's frustrating. And that's not, again, condoning criminal acts. I've, I've sent my share of folks to jail uh, when I thought it was appropriate for public safety purposes. But I think if we can create a system that is based on public health, where we can use science and get away from this kind of arbitrariness of the criminal justice system to inform our judgment about who's truly a threat to us, well, that's fine. That Public safety comes first. But who's sick? Who needs help? And then to make sure that we have the, the assets in the community, which, which frankly we don't, mm -hmm. to get them into treatment. I was at a, an event last night, Ed. Really is a heartbreaking story um, from a mother uh, whose child was, uh, suffers from, from mental illness, depression, and um, seemed to be suicidal. And this mom talked about um, being at the hospital all day and having no beds in the community in which her child could to go to. And uh, this feeling of absolute helplessness uh, to protect her child. And we gotta understand, we got an obligation here uh, to build that infrastructure when we talk what, what a safe and vibrant community is for everybody. Uh, we got to make sure we take care of the most vulnerable. And, and in my opinion, people who are sick, and when we talk about mental illness, when we talk about addiction, they're sick. Yeah. Uh, we got an obligation to take care of them and to treat them uh, as they are, which is sick. Um, and I, I'm not sure we've achieved that because I think you and I both would agree uh, that stigma still attaches to those uh, uh, who are in recovery. Uh, those who are actively using, uh, and those who are mentally ill, and oftentimes, all th they're all wrapped in together. Um, so we got more work to do. Absolutely, loud and clear. A great, very, very strong uh, message. Uh, I mean, I, I, for one, and I'm sure you, are proud of Vermont. We're, yep. we're leaders uh, in the nation. The naloxone laws, yep. the hub and spoke. Um, Absolutely. System. Yep. It is. It is a model. Lawmakers, uh, the general public, um, people seem to be marshalling behind this idea of addiction as a disease, yep. trying to um, speak in positive terms. We use terms like substance use disorder, you know, rather than drug abuse. Yep. Yep. Trying to raise consciousness and give it a, the medical kind of definition rather than a punitive Absolutely. kind of a definition. Absolutely. Your message is uh, loud and clear. I have naloxone in my in my car, by the way. I went wow. to my local yep. drugstore, got myself yep. a, a nasal yep. uh, kit, and just in case, I, yep. I want to be ready to save a life if I possibly Absolutely. can. Yep. You know, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> people sometimes having to be revived multiple times, yep. and the general public really doesn't understand that that is proof positive that this is a powerful brain disease. Yeah. This is a symptom. Yeah. that someone would go back and engage in life-threatening behavior again, yeah. really against their own will. Yeah. There's that compulsion. It's not really a choice. Yeah. We hear that a lot. Yeah. It's a compulsion. It's a brain disease. Which brings us to, um, you mentioned that the crime is also associated with, yep. with addiction, and it is. It's one of the symptoms, symptomatic behavior. What about 
people who there's a little bit of attention or a lot of attention being placed on people who are incarcerated for committing crimes but have substance use disorder or specifically opioid yeah. use disorder. Yeah. What about them? Well, I want to answer that question. I just want to first follow up on your point about um, uh, people who, who, who are so sick that uh, they know they, they, they go back and use again mm -hmm. um, and knowing that they'll get sick and even die. And you know, I, I've always looked at this disease as, for me it was always, and my thinking has evolved, mm -hmm. but for me it was always, how do you put a needle into your arm? How do you put a needle into your arm? The, the, the thought repulses me. Yeah. Uh, but in talking to folks um, who've done it, uh, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, they talk about how desperate they are, yeah. how sick they are, yeah. um, and how much they need that fix that snorting it doesn't do it. Yeah. Um, and it's not a rational decision. Uh, and that's you're absolutely right about that. I, and I say that from a, a perspective of not science, uh, I say it from a perspective of talking to folks who've done it. Sure. Uh, real, real, real Vermonters who struggle with this disease. People who are afraid of needles. Absolutely, yeah. and, and um, a remarkable, uh, just a remarkable thing to hear somebody say that to you when you ask them, how can, and, and ju me passing judgment, how can you do that? How, you know, for me it repulses this. Yeah. And it, it really reinforces the point that they're just so sick and desperate, it's not a rational decision at all. Um, folks who are um, in jail, who suffer from addiction. Uh, number one, I, I struggle with the idea that uh, folks should be in jail who are in there as a result of their addiction. And this is not to, to excuse personal responsibility. Uh, but I think if we're real serious, we need to make sure that we have, again, the assets in the community, inpatient rehab, no waiting lists. And we do, the Hub and Spokes is a great model. Mm -hmm. It's a great model. Um, we need to do more. But if you're in jail, um, my position is very clear. Uh, you should receive medication. Mm -hmm. uh, because you're incarcerated, uh, you are not entitled uh, to medically assisted treatment. Uh, but if you're outside, you are. Uh, you know, if people are, and here's the thing about jail. I say this all the time to folks. I say this as a prosecutor. Here's the thing about jail. They're going to get out. The vast majority of people in jail are going to get out. Mm -hmm. And it's in our collective best interest as a community to make sure that people who are incarcerated have a successful reentry back into our community. Mm -hmm. That's what's in the interest of public safety. Talk about housing, talk about education, talk about jobs. None of that matters unless they're healthy. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, if somebody is, is using, uh, they're not making those rational decisions. Uh, they're a risk to themselves, they're a risk to the, to the community. So I do think that we should have medically assisted treatment uh, available to, to folks in jail. Look, the Department of Corrections has done a good thing uh, they're extending the use to 120 days. Uh, frankly, I think we should be looking at, uh, and my understanding of the, of the policy is that you have to be currently in treatment on the outside in order to be, mm -hmm. uh, the, to have the treatment continued while you're incarcerated. And that's fine, I support that. I also think we should consider starting treatment for people in jail. Mm -hmm. um, I think jail can have a powerful effect on people uh, to really do some self-examination and perhaps that's an opportunity for people to say, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm ready uh, to make a change. They may come to that conclusion, but unless the services and the medicine is there, mm -hmm. you know, and so we got to continue to, to push, push the argument uh, to expand the use of treatment we have to continue to uh, make the argument that prevention mm -hmm. uh, is really, I think, the game changer in this mm -hmm. debate that I don't think we talk enough about. You know, when we talk about babies being born opiate addicted, yeah. uh, we should be outraged in this state. Yeah. We should be outraged. Uh, I think any pregnant woman who is, um, a, uh, who is using, I'm a big believer in these nurse family 
partnerships where um, you send a nurse uh, to somebody's home, uh, a message of wellness, a message of health, you get prenatal care, uh, you get, a, you get a, a healthy baby, you get a healthy mom. And I think the national studies uh, where these programs do exist show a, a great redu reduction in uh, childhood abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the other thing, Ed, that I've become more educated about and, and frankly a believer in is this idea of adverse childhood experiences and, mm -hmm. and how important those early years are uh, to brain development and ha how important um, uh, they are when you're growing up in a, in a family where you have this stress, where there is that issue of addiction, where there's that issue of uh, perhaps domestic violence, mm -hmm. uh, that issue of just uh, poverty where you don't know if you're going to eat or not, if you're going to be safe. And I think as you know, the science is pretty clear that that stress becomes toxic mm -hmm. uh, on, that, on that child and, and the development of, the, of, of their brain leads to higher rates of mental health issues later in life, higher rates of addiction, actually lowers life expectancy. Absolutely. All, all on issues that happen in those early years, zero to three, zero to five. We need to be making investments in those homes. That's, well, I, that's the game changer. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, and it's so refreshing to hear that you think this way and that your attitudes are being shaped this way. Childhood resilience, yep. I think, is the, the key. Absolutely. To the future, the, the research is showing that stress or toxic stress, as you've mentioned, actually affects the way that genes uh, direct cell development uh, in organs such as the brain. Yep. And that's where the impulsivity in adolescence is, can be a result of the brains not developing along healthy lines. One of the impulsive decisions being handling stress or handling tension or yeah. handling problems by taking psychoactive chemicals. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I hear you saying clearly is that you understand that, that this is a multi-generational project that we're undertaking here. Yep. That this is going to be going out 20, 30 years. We, we, and it's the children and their children's children that, that, that need to live differently, that the demand for drugs needs to change. And the way we do that is helping children to learn how to grow up and make healthy decisions and have the resources available yeah. to them to enjoy life. Yeah, absolutely, I mean, it, it is, it, listen, it's about the next generation. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's about kids and um, that's why the prevention uh, is so important, but you gotta have the resources. And you know, you're right about multi-generational um, and I think we got to be honest about it. And I'm going to put political correctness to the side. And again, you know, being being that prosecutor in court over 10 years, and uh, frankly, seeing generations prosecuting generations of mm -hmm. families, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you got to ask yourself the question: Why? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think uh, uh, cr cr criminal behavior is genetic. <laughs> you know, but lack of opportunity. Um, it certainly creates these circumstances where you take away hope, where you take away opportunity, uh, where you have kept people in, impoverished. <clears throat> you, you know, in this, uh, the other part, you talk about resiliency. I'm a big believer in that, um, and the power of of positive uh, relationships, whether it's you know with your own parents or with others outside uh, of your family. Um, to build res resiliency and to overcome ad adversity. Uh, I was lucky, as I said, uh, there was nothing, um, there was nothing great about me growing up, uh, but I was surrounded um, certainly by a family, but also by uh, a larger um, extended family and even, even, even a larger community. Uh, I got a lot of second chances. I got a lot of second chances by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that made all the difference in the world to me. Um, and that's, that's a powerful thing when you think about that. And that's, that's, that's never left me. I do know, I do see that in you, and I've heard a little bit about you. And I, I, I do think, I've been told that you get your sense of justice from your dad <laughs> and your passion from your mom. <laughs> you, you, know, you, know, you know, my dad was... Um, 
had an incredible influence on my life. Um, was a was a solo practitioner. I was a lawyer, um, and worked on the top of College Street. And uh, you know what I would say is was a street lawyer in the sense that he'd take anybody that walked in off the street. Yeah. Uh, but he loved helping people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, didn't care much for bureaucracy. Uh, didn't care much um, uh, for titles. Uh, cared about people. Mm -hmm. uh, cared about the underdog. Uh, if somebody was down on their, lu their luck, my father was for them. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was just, I, I think, by instinct um, and this sense of, of empathy and compassion. And he, he, he loved, um, and he was able to find, I think, the humor um, in it all, mm -hmm. which is a special trait when you think about it. Um, no matter how bad things are, uh, if you're able to find the humor in it, mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty powerful uh, defense mechanism. Uh, the, that ability to laugh, that, that ability to overcome, uh, the ability, to, I think, to put things in perspective and to keep going. Um, and he, so he, he, you know, and look, he didn't make a lot of money. Um, raised six kids. Six kids? Six that's kids. That's a lot of kids. It's a lot of kids. Um, and he just, he, he had a, he knew who he was. Mm. Um, and I think he was comfortable with who he was. And he was a pretty quiet guy. Um, he was not a fancy guy. Um, uh, was a, was, was somebody who, um, was content, I think, um, in being one of those people who made a difference quietly for people. Nice. Um, <clears throat> and often, and it was no great act, mm -hmm. but often what it was, Ed, was um, a willingness to listen, uh, a, a willingness to uh, advocate on somebody's behalf uh, when, frankly, nobody had anybody to advocate for them, and just a willingness to, to, to believe in people. And... Um, that willingness to, to believe in people, um, I, I've really tried to yeah. to emulate, tried to, to bring it into the work I do, you know, because in my in my system, uh, or I should say this, the criminal justice system or the legal system, it's an adversarial system. Mm -hmm. And I tend to believe, and I, I think I get this from my father, uh, certainly get it from growing up in this community. I believe most people are good people. Mm -hmm. We all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, we all have regrets. Um, and, uh, you know, that idea of how do you build that resi resiliency, well, you build it by, um, I think, seeing people in your life um, keep things in perspective, keep them balanced, and this willingness to overcome. Mm -hmm. We didn't have much, um, but we had everything we needed. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a lot of laughter um, because that ability to find the humor and the absurdity of life sometimes, um, it, what, you know, the good and the bad, uh, the, the painful is pretty powerful stuff. Perfect uh, example of, of resilience. And uh, I'm sure your, your dad and your mom, too, were a wonderful and very strong models uh, for you. Yeah, you know, look, my mother, she is a passionate lady, and, um, um, you know, she, she, again, another person who is always going to choose the underdog mm -hmm. uh, and will, will certainly advocate uh, on their behalf. And um, I think both my parents who, and again, they weren't, they, they were extraordinary to, to us, but they were ordinary folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the message, and you know, didn't have fancy titles, didn't, weren't members of, of any boards or, mm -hmm. um, but, but that, you know, that interaction of seeing your parents interact and treat people the same, regardless of who they were, mm -hmm. uh, what their station in life was, 
that's the message that I got from my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, that message of, of equality and really the value of, of, of everybody. And it wasn't sat down and wasn't taught to us. Or, you just saw it. Yeah. You saw it. You saw yeah. it practiced. And um, I, I look back at that often and, you know, I, I hopefully am um, demonstrating that behavior to my own children. Uh, that you meet people where they're at, you respect everybody, everybody has value, um, titles don't matter, positions don't matter, um, uh, be a regular person, and, and care about people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and look, we weren't without our struggles, uh, you know, uh, but I think what I came away from in my childhood um, was seeing uh, both my parents uh, really respect and, and and interact with people um, with with a great sense of 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 understanding of of who people are and who they, you know the one thing that also was taught to me is you know don't get too big for your britches mm -hmm. don't take mm -hmm. yourself too seriously mm -hmm. um, you know and it, it never mattered about, it, 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 I mean, I could, <laughs> it doesn't matter about, uh, you know, what position I have uh, uh, or what um, I may have or may not have achieved politically uh, to my family, including my, my siblings. Um, it doesn't matter. And, and they... They remind me of that often, <laughs> but it's a healthy thing. <laughs> it is a healthy thing. And you obviously uh, bring all those qualities and all those views toward life into your position as our attorney general. And I, wa I want to I thank you for that. Thank you. That is, that is refreshing. That is genuine. That is hopeful. It, that's what reverberates with people. So thank you for your leadership. Well, thank you. In closing, in closing, I, I'd like to ask you to tell our viewing audience, especially the people out there with substance use disorder, what, 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 what do you want to tell them? Well, that we care about you um, mm -hmm. and we hear you yeah. and that we believe in you yeah. and that uh, there is hope for a better tomorrow, uh, that shame and stigma and guilt uh, needs to be put to the side that this is hard work, uh, but the community supports you, our state supports you. Uh, we're a better state uh, with you in it, mm -hmm. uh, being productive, law-abiding, sober, and that we want to work with you to make sure that uh, the pieces and the structures are in place for people to be healthy, uh, people to be happy, people to be productive. Listen, let me tell you, Ed, you know, we talk about affordability, we talk about our challenges in the economy. Um, we need people, there's so many great people who have been sidelined as a result of this addiction. Absolutely. Who have such potential. Absolutely. We need to, we need to give people second chances. Absolutely. We need to get people back in the game and let them create, mm -hmm. let them innovate, let them come up with the next best idea based on their skill, based on their desire, and based on their own ideas. That's the value of Vermont. That's the value of Vermonters. And we gotta give people the opportunity to, to give them a fair shot, uh, because I know people can do it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you TJ. I just wanna say in closing that you've, you've heard uh, Attorney uh, General Donovan today. Uh, we, we know how difficult it is for you. We do not think this is easy. And we will continue uh, to strive to understand you and to develop uh, access and availability of help for you until we have reached each and every one of you. So thank you.